So it is what we call non-proportional. That means it doesn't mean that you practice 10 units of time, it means that you must improve 10 units of performance. It doesn't go that way. So you imagine that as a coach, because you have the power, you have the authority to change your rules, the equipment that you use, you can actually help them to have maybe sudden increase in improvement. Or sometimes it may also have a dip in, in performance too. And that's normal. That's normal as well. And there are many different ways where your athletes can achieve the same outcome or, or do the same do the same task. For example, you ask them to kick a ball towards a the target. They can kick it in different ways, right? They can use the inside here, the shoelaces, the outstep as well, or even maybe use the toe to pop the ball towards the target. There's different ways of doing it, but if it gets the ball to a target effectively, successfully, it means that it's useful, right? It doesn't mean that there's only one way of doing it. So again, your learners do display those things. Sometimes some of your kids can achieve or be successful in your game or in your sports. But by doing some very different ways that maybe you are not familiar with, or maybe it's not accepted as really this should be the way to do it. They may not, but yet they still achieve or be able to, to, to get or be successful. That would mean that hey, you should maybe allow maybe that kind of of uh, room, alright, the different ways of, of being, being, being successful. And in terms of what we can control. We have a lot of power as coaches, right? To say, look, I can change many of the rules in my training. Rules in terms of what? I can change the size, the length of the racket, right? I can let them use the full length racket. I can use a shorter modified racket for skids who are smaller. Right? I can change maybe the play area as well. Let's say in a football game. I can have very rapid area so that they have more time, that they can take the ball and they can move and more space. Or you can have very, very small area. And what happens there? They have less time to be on the ball. Right? So that means there's a lot more challenge and more, it's more difficult for them. So by changing this kind of what we call um, ingredients in your activity, the rules, you can see them maybe showing very, very different behavior. When you have a big area, they can take the ball and they maybe want to dribble a little bit more. But when it's a very small area, there's very little time for them to dribble the ball, let's say football, they can just pass the ball a little bit more, more often. So therefore you think about it in your own sports because you are coaches of different sports. You know your game very well and you know perhaps maybe there are some things that you can change, okay? some things that you can make different and you will see many different behaviors coming about. Okay? Your, your kids, your children showing many different behaviors. I talk about that variability in practice, right? It means that, as I mentioned, Use different size balls, use different playing area, different length racket, different height for badminton or volleyball perhaps. And maybe you can also encourage and help the students maybe try different ways of doing things. And that helps in terms of them finding their own ways to be successful. And actually, therefore, what I mentioned in the last five minutes, right? All of these things, it means that those learners are actually showing all these different uh, behaviors, right? they do actually exhibit or show this kind of behavior. It means that, hey, if they do show this kind of behavior, maybe the way we coach them should maybe also help, right? To allow them to, to learn in that way. Because in actual fact, in the practice condition, in the practice practices, practice sessions, they actually show those things. Suddenly, they see huge improvement. When you change a racket size, playing area, you see them do different things. You have a lot of... Um, Variability or differences in the way you use the balls, the play area, the racket, leg, you see them exploring, searching for new movement behaviors. Those things are happening. So therefore, as a coach, maybe then I should coach the way that I think my chip, my, my kid and my, my child will learn. Because they they do show those those behaviors. But many times typically, sometimes coaches tend to want to just have very repeated practices, right? That means they always do the same thing over and over again. Because I think I want consistency, meaning that I want them to show me, show, be able to, to do these things the same way over and over again, 10 times, 20 times, 30 times. Yes, they may do very well in terms of repeating, showing the same movement, but when it comes to the actual game setting, actual game itself, can they actually show that? It's very difficult because in the game, it's very different. Right? There are many things happening in the game. 
So therefore, really, the, the focus is, look, can, can you as a coach think that, hey, look, I know that there are very, very important ingredients in my, in, in my practices and in the game. For example, the learner, the, the player itself is one big ingredient. The environment is one big ingredient as well, right? Not just that, the task itself, what are they supposed to do? It's another big ingredient. So you have the athlete, the environment, and the task. All these are three big ingredients in affecting what they would show in the games I think, or in the practice I think. And these three ingredients will all work with each other so that at the end of the day, you see that behavior that is shown by your athlete and your child. So therefore, as a coach, you must think about, hey, what are these things here that I can change or I, I need to know so that I can make some changes to maybe the task or the environment more importantly. The learner, you need to know, okay, does this kid or child has the flexibility, has the strength, has the height, has the build to do what I want the person to do. Right? So you need to think about all this as well. So I will very quickly share some of these principles. I'm not going to go into very much detail, but importantly, some things to consider as coaches as well when you are planning your practices. I think first and foremost, you want it to be your practice to be as real as possible, right? To how your athlete will perform that skill or play the game. So in like what Vincent mentioned, having 10, 15 people lining up to take a shot in football or something. Instead, what is really likely to happen in a game setting? Unlikely, right? So you need to make sure that you plan your practices to be as real as it can to how they will use that skill. Okay? So that's what I mean by representativeness. Not just that, but also think about as a coach, right? I talk about the three big ingredients, isn't it? The learner, the, 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 the athlete, the environment, okay, and your task. Now, you as a coach, right? We talk about you playing the role as a facilitator means you are supporting them. Not as someone who prescribe means to tell them as a give what to do. So as a coach, you can really think about the things that you can control and can change. So as I mentioned, right, the equipment that you use, you can always change and, and make uh, add new stuff in there, take away stuff. The rules that you have, you can have more points if a person play a, 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 a stroke in badminton to an area. To encourage, to help them say, hey, let's, let's play this show a little bit more. Let's say the drop shot, for example. If they play the drop shot, the area nearer to the net, give them three points. So by changing all these rules, right, you help to encourage different behaviors. We also want to think about many times if your kids and your, ch and your and the children that you deal with or you work with, if they find it very difficult to perform the movement, let's say some of them may have difficulty just serving in so what can you do to simplify it, to make it easier for them? Yes, no? Yes? Sometimes some kids may have trouble with it. So just, suppose I get there, So you may then reduce the input that is, that is, that is asked of them, right, for the meeting. Ah. So have the shuttle here to the racket. Yes, that's the different way. So you reduce the difficulty, you simplify the task. Or many times, because of a longer racket, they have to use, which is a bit difficult. And you also can shorten the racket. You can shorten the racket by actually having them choke the racket. It means they can hold it a bit closer to the racket face. That is also easier for them. If someone in netball or basketball having difficulty trying to catch the ball, can use maybe bigger size ball. Some even go to the extent of using like beach ball. Because beach ball stays in the air longer, right? Because it floats in the air a little bit longer. So, the child who may have difficulty trying to get to the space to pick up the ball and pick up the pass can now have more time because the ball stays in the air longer. Let's say in beach ball. So, these are examples of the A. Hey, look, there are so many ways for me to think about re reducing the difficulty of the task. Making it easy so that your kids find success. They can, they can achieve some form of success. So you need to think about this. There are many, many ways to reduce the task difficulty. So you know your sport better, so you can think about that as well. But 
attention and focus meaning, hey, many times as coaches, we tend to say, you know, I want you to hold the racket in this way, I want you to lift your arm in this way, I want you to stand this way. So what we are saying here is very much what we call the form of the movement, right? A lot of instructions, a lot of instructions is, is to how you should stand, how you should move. But some of the instructions that you give, right, can actually be, hey, a bit more outcome, outcome focused, meaning for example, I want the shuttle to, to fly in the air in a certain way, in a rainbow, like a rainbow. Maybe I want the ball to be on the ground. Okay. Maybe I want it to be at the target. So a lot of the time is actually very outcome focused. So you try to lower or reduce the attention that is paid on the form as well. Because sometimes when the children and the kids take a lot on the form, they miss out what is important and that is really hitting the ball or the shuttle over the net for example. And they will think about how they swing but all the attention is on the arm and the leg. And missing what is important is, hey, as long as I get the shuttle over the net, as I get the shuttle into an area where my opponent cannot get the shuttle or the ball, hey, I made a point too, right? And I can do it in slightly different ways too. So you need to think about that too. So some of the instructions can, put, can be more towards an outcome focus, outcome and stronger emphasis on outcome. Okay, so variability as mentioned already, I think it's a change your rules, change your uh, equipment. So I think you add a bit of that variability in there to help them you know, maybe look for their own uh, solutions. So uh, in regards to, yeah, I understand the lower down. So, but until which level, because we do not also want them to develop back habits, which can lead to injuries or etc. So, until which level do we want to rectify this? So, again, I'm not saying that this is the only way to do it. Okay, so, the question is very real. You say, at what level then do I say, no, I must tell them a bit more about the movement form, right? So that it is safe for them. So, the idea is this yes, we want to reduce the difficulty. But we also want, want to reduce the difficulty of the task so that it is so different from how they would use the skill in the actual game setting, for example. Okay? So again, you say you want to reduce the difficulty, you want to throw the racket, but after a while you also want to slowly move the hands back to, the, to where you will hold the racket as well. Okay, at what level, again, it is perhaps a time where if you think that there is safety is being compromised, I mean safety is an issue, then there is a time where you say maybe not this kind of exploration. I will be a little bit more uh, specific and clear about what you can or cannot do. If safety is especially a concern. And especially not just safety, but if you know as a coach, if you know that if the person hits a ball or makes certain movements and over a long period of time you think that this will potentially lead to injury. There's not a one-time injury, but injury that you would pick up because of over a period of time. Then that's where you can come in and also make some changes as well. So especially when safety injury is a concern, you can come in and be a little bit more firm about hey, maybe your arm should be moving this way, your leg should be moving because it could be dangerous for you. So that is what you can do too. And your part about the bad habits could be sometimes maybe you may think that there's a bad habit, but maybe for that person, if it's not dangerous, they won't sustain injury, that bad habit could be something that the person is very good for him or her. He or she, because of the person's physical makeup, is actually suitable for the person. So that's where that coaching is not all about the science, so it's also about the art, where you need to be able to pick up and see, is this going to be dangerous? If this person do it for a long period of time, is it going to be going to lead to injury or not? Okay, so these are things that you need to be clear as well. And you know your game and your sports way better. That's where you should be. So, I'm going to just very quickly go through, we talk about constraints and approach. Uh, again, I share with you the constraints. Just now I mentioned about the three big ingredients, right? In terms of your practices and your performance of your learner, okay? Your environment and your task. Those actually are the key constraints that you can be a bit more, to think about it a lot more, especially when you plan your training and your practices. Because these different ingredients and these different constraints, right? They all work with each other and you see your athletes showing very different or specific behaviors. Okay? 
Let's have a quick look at this. So my favorite clip uh, it shows that how the different ingredients and constraints work each other. You see a buffer, right? You can read the subtitles there as well. But why is it that he's swinging his golf cart in that way? It's because of the environment that constraint is working with. It is because of the lack of space in where he has been practicing his golf swing, right? And therefore, you see this very funny golf swing behavior. And it's very true because those constraints, the environment, the learner, and the past, they all work with each other. And that's why for this Japanese golfer, you see that as something that is okay for him. But maybe in the long run, he may have certain injuries to his joints. But he worked for him on the golf course for him because all the kind of practice environment, the practice sessions that he has at home. And that's why as coaches, right, you think about it, you have so much power in terms of how you plan your practices. And the way you plan your practices, the way you set up the rules, the equipment that they use, you can also help your learners and your and your players and athletes pick up very different interesting movements at the end of the day. And because of all that ingredients of your constraint of your learner, your environment and your task working with each other. And that's why you see that very strange but effective swing for him. So think about all as a coach you really have so much control and power in what you can do to help your athletes pick up many different types of skills. So as I mentioned to you, right, I mean these are quite technical terms and I won't go in there, we'll go, go through that review, but you can see those clearly the performer, which is your athlete, your task, your environment, those are the three big ingredients of what we call three big constraints that you need to think about. Because the way they work each other, you see some final movement coming out. Now I'll go through some of these big ingredients, right? What, what, what do they consist? Your performer. Obviously, for example, the performer you need to think about, right? What kind of size do they have? What are the physical characteristics of that they have? Are they big? Are they strong? Are they flexible? Okay? So you need to consider that. Not just that, but how about the, the mental aspects of it, right? Are they mentally strong? Do they need more of like spoon feeding, you giving them instructions, or how do they learn? What are, what are their characteristics? What are their personality? What, what as a person, what, how, do they, how do they behave in your, in your, in your training sessions? So all those things, right, as a coach, I think it's important for you to take note of as well. The environment is something that we deal with a lot, right? Especially for all our games. The surface here, this is a wonderful surface if you play a ball in football, the ball will roll very nicely. But on an uneven ground, the ball will roll very differently. So, that in itself, when you have your practice session where the surface is very, very different, and let's say there's a lot of holes, it's not flat like that, the way you teach and the way you plan your practice will also be very challenging, will also be very different in terms of what you want the kid to be able to do. Even the best of players will also find it very difficult if the ground is uneven. Right? So think about the place and environment as well that you are practicing or that you are planning your practices. Obviously, for sailing, right, environment is a very, very big ingredient, a big factor there. Okay, so you need to account for that too. As well. So, the environmental factors are something that, the environmental factors something that you need to think about. Even more of what we call, even the, when you have audience there, watching your athletes train, that can have an impact too, right? It means they have some, some effect as well. They always practice and play with nobody around watching them, but when it comes to the actual competition, you have your whole school watching them, it has a very big impact on them because they are not used to it. So how can you help them in their practices? Maybe to have some of their friends watch them even in practice when they want to prepare for a game. So those are things they need to think about. Okay. Now class constraints is the one where I say coaches have a lot of control. Like the rules as I mentioned, what do you want them to do, which is the goals. The equipment that they use. We have a lot of control over that. Swimming, we have a lot. We can use a lot of the, the, the equipment as well. The box, flippers, lots and lots of things that you can do. And when you change all these things, it all has different impact or even how 
you will change the way your learners learn because of these things that you can do. But the idea is this, as a coach, therefore, the idea coming also that's shared by Vincent is that, hey, I really want our kids and our children to be active in the learning. At least you want them to discover for themselves perhaps what they can do or what they cannot do at that point in time. So we really want them to be more discovery and more what we call directed, meaning that as a coach, maybe you don't want to tell them exactly what to do, but you can change the rules, you can change the goals, you can use certain equipment so that you help them to maybe pick up certain skills that will be useful in the actual performance setting. I talk about Google Talk, right? You mentioned about what, what, what is a what is a, what is a bad habit. Michael Johnson, right? A very famous 400 meter uh, runner, athlete. The way he runs, right? He's just very upright, right? But he's the Olympic and world champion. But that works for him. Okay? So because of his own individual, his own performance on straight, it works for him. And some of the players that you see, let's say in basketball, maybe they have very different strokes in terms of a span or a drop shot, but that's because they have their own performance constraints that works for them. But then yet, other people may try to copy but may not have the physical constraints to, to, to repeat what that expert can do. We talk about this as well, the way we play our high jump, this was a typical way, right? Kind of like a straddle, but look, someone came along and did the backflip, right? That work. So, it doesn't matter for high jump, if you can clear the bar, you are a winner anyway, right? So, it doesn't matter, of course, safety and not land on your head. But sure, and this guy came along, he was very, and he kind of revolutionized this, changed the whole thinking about how to do the high jump. And that is uh, something that works for him, and people then try to repeat and copy. And that's how it works as well. <clears throat> so, again, there is Sometimes a lot of thinking that hey, we must try to do like how the expert do, and everybody must follow how the expert do. But every learner is so different. Like some of them may not have the strength to do what the expert is showing. So you must think about for each of the individual, like what you can say, right? Go down to each of the of the athlete. What can this person do or not do? Maybe this person can do a swing or a move or something, some movement that is good for him in this way. Same thing but still effective and meaningful. Then, okay, let the person do it that way, perhaps. And see if there's a bad habit in terms of injury, can I correct it or not? Maybe. Let the person move from one stage to the next stage to the next stage progressively. So I'll talk about this very quickly already. As I mentioned, the rules and the rules are something that the coaches can change a lot. And I'll share later on in the particular session some examples of how you can change the rules change the task constraints as well. So the idea is this, you have a lot of power to change these rules, goals, equipment, the task constraints. And like I say, you know your game and your sports very well. So you must see, hey, I want them to hit, let's say, a drop shot in badminton. What can I do to help them make their drop shot better? Can I change the height of the net? Can I change the scoring so that if they hit the shutter nearer to the net, and your opponent's caught, they just crosses the net. Because that's good, right? Because it's difficult for your opponent to defend that kind of shot. I give them three points if they do that, for example. So you help them, encourage them, help them to find success as well. Right, this is just an example of a video where I show, okay, this is a bit more technical as football because we did some work with schools. So, for example, switching of play means you change your direction of attack. Let's say in football in this case, you attack on the right, but you want to help and help your kids learn, hey, when it is very crowded here, right, means I must switch my attack from right to go to left. So that's switch play. Okay? So this is what we call a right? coach teacher center where the coach will tell them exactly what to do and there'll be a lot of repeated practices and drills. Okay, so this is what this what this is all about. You can see, right? Okay, you stand on one side, the other person on one side, you play the ball left and right, okay? And I want you to repeat 10 times. But I tell you exactly how to do it. Okay? There's no defenders there, there's no game situations there, right? But this is maybe some of the ways that we, uh, we, we do ask our, our, our learners and our players to, play, to, to, to learn. But maybe this is a little bit more athlete centered. Alright? We 
you notice on the left side they get the ball all the way through, they play the ball to the other side, there's opponents, they kick the ball, they stop for a while now. If you notice this setting here, in the game here, do you see that there are also two pawns here? And then two more pawns are over. So in this playing area, right, it's a 3D or 4D4 game. One pawn here, one pawn here, another pawn here, another pawn here. This team attack here, this team attack there. This team that's attacking, the team that's attacking always have an option. That means they can choose to score either this goal or this goal. By having these two small goals at the corner of the playing area, right, you already that kind of the kids will know, hey, if I go to score here and it's very, very crowded, many, many people here, I cannot make the ball move there and score, what do I do? Because there's another goal on the other corner, I can move the ball from right to left. Just by having two small goals at each corner, you really have to encourage the kids to think that, hey, I can actually move the ball around. Of course, technically, as coaches, you know there's a switch play. But the kids may not understand that that is a switch play in terms of the term. But they know because you set the rules in the playing area in that way, they know that, hey, if there's a ball on one side, I make the ball move to the other side. And that becomes something that they realize can work for them. So you change the rules like that, and you see that kind of behavior coming out. And you can see clearly that there are opponents in there, two small goals in there, very, very what we call representative, meaning that it is happening in a real game situation. So these are examples there. Now I'll hand my time over to Mira and she will share a little bit more about how she has been using some of these ideas for trying to build sprints. Again, the stats. Um, this is a 
another example of staying low. Right? So can I get another volunteer? <laughs>
Let's go to draw the feedback over to your friend Alicia. Okay? Uh, call already is just like very really friendly, okay? It's not about to be right? Let's go and get the call. Okay. Let's go and get the call. So what kind of things can you change to do? Instead of doing this way, you will be doing this way. Higher. Okay. So that's what I said about the lay of market as well. You can say that, hey, when you throw out the lay back over to your friend, it needs to be above the lay of market. Okay. Let's see what they do. Okay. Or else, they need to change the rule to say, Okay. So, 